So in this session, we look again at chapter 13, and I've titled it, Why is Love So Important? Let's start by reading the whole of chapter 13. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonour others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This chapter can be divided in various ways. My preference is to look at it in three sections. In the first, from verses one to three, we see that love alone authenticates spiritual people. In the second section, from verses 4 to 7, we see that love controls the thoughts and actions of spiritual people. And then in the final verses, from 8 to 13, we see that love is eternal and complete, while grace gifts are temporal. So let's first look then at those opening three verses. Love authenticates Christians or spiritual people. Paul writes now in the first person singular, perhaps in order to sound a little more gentle and pastoral. Look at verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong. But it also reminds us that though Paul, like any other Christian, does not have all the grace gifts, he actually does have at least one or two of those that the elitists consider most exceptional. For example, he later says that he speaks in tongues more than most. What I think is important here is to recognise again that Paul is concerned with not how good or useless certain gifts are, but with how Christians, that is, spiritual people, should be identified. When he says in verse 1, If I do not have love, I have become a noisy gong. He's answering the question, who or what am I? As a Christian, is he no more than a lot of noise, a clanging cymbal? In verse 2, he's even clearer. Even if he has some pretty spectacular gifts, without love, he says, I am nothing. And verse 3 ends with, I gain nothing. This is the exact opposite of what the status seekers sought. It's the exact opposite of what they believe they could achieve with the exercise of their gifts. They make a noise and want to be noticed. They claim to be someone in the eyes of all people and they think they gain status. From a human perspective, Paul lists some impressive gifts and even talks of giving away all possessions and one's life for the cause. Self-sacrifice on behalf of others and giving food to the poor or even selling possessions in order to do so is a well-known, noble concept that provides status in many societies, whether in Roman Corinth or even in some Christian circles today. To this day, we give honour and look up to those we call philanthropists. 
And yet none of this gains a person the objective status before God that they want. Rather, their status will be authenticated in the life of love, following the way of love. It is perhaps ironic that we use the word philanthropist, which means love of humanity, for those who are generous to those around them. In general terms, of course, they're doing good and helping people, but Paul redefines love in the light of the gospel. In spite of the world's meaning, philanthropy, love of humanity from Paul's perspective, can exist without true love. So now in this next section, he goes on to show how true authentic agape, Christian love, will manifest itself. Secondly then, in verses 4 to 7, we see that love controls the thoughts and actions of spiritual people. It has been said that in these verses, Paul offers an idealized description of love, something beautiful to behold, but unachievable in the purity of its description. My own view is that that entirely misses the point. As Paul lays it out here, he clearly describes a way of life, just as he referred to the way at the end of chapter 12. In Christian terms, we cannot help but see the figure of Christ in this description of love. And in this sense, it cannot rightly be described as idealized, because this is the description perfectly seen in the man, Jesus Christ. Christ is identified in many ways, but one identification of the Lord is clearly that he reveals love in all its perfections. Thus we may say as we read this, that to the extent we imitate Christ, we shall indeed be identified by our love, love for God and for our neighbour. As we look at Paul's description here, we can see various, what we might call, positive aspects of love, and some that are described in terms of its opposite. So, for example, we see positively in verse 4 that love is patient and kind. But we also see that it does not envy and is not proud or dishonouring of others, and so on. Where it is set in contrast with its opposite, we surely have a description of some of the elitists. Paul has already criticised their arrogance and pride on several occasions. They have encouraged the envy of certain grace gifts. They have been accused of being self-seeking and so on. So beautiful and poetic as this passage is, we have to say that it is a hard-hitting piece of rhetoric. Simply from our own practical point of view, we should not be lulled into missing the significance of the passage because of its wonderful prose. Any sign of boasting, envy, pride, self-seeking behaviour, anger, delighting in evil, like the couple caught in incest seem to be doing, any of these are roundly condemned here. This description of love is therefore fully orbed. It goes far beyond being nice to people, or some emotional attachment to another person. As we've said, Paul rightly describes it as a way. It is about being, not just about doing. This is why it really can be said to authenticate the true believer, to be that which marks out the spiritual person. It is part of who Jesus is, and so it should be for all who belong to him. It is part of who God is. God is love. And so it should be for all who are known by him as his people. And then, thirdly, we come to the final verses 8 to 13, where we see how love is eternal while grace gifts are passing away. If we ever needed any final evidence that Paul's controversy with the elitists centred around the question of who is truly spiritual, that is, who truly commands status among God's people, then it is these final verses of chapter 13. From verse 8 onwards, Paul develops his eschatological framework for understanding the distinction between the nature of love on the one hand and of the grace gifts on the other. Interestingly, in this section, love is mentioned only in verse 8 and then at the end of verse 13. 
When we understand the eternal nature of love and the temporary nature of the grace gifts, then we can see immediately why the one can truly identify and authenticate Christians as it identifies them through into all eternity, while the other simply passes away at the return of Christ when we see face to face. And Paul makes his point here in two ways. First, he contrasts the eternal status-identifying nature of love and the temporal nature of grace gifts which come to an end. So in verse 8, he argues that love never fails, but grace gifts, and he lists several examples, will pass away. And notice once again that he lists knowledge among these. But secondly, there is the contrast between what is partial and what is complete or perfect. And again in verse 9, Paul has a dig at knowledge. We know in part, but this will disappear, he says. On the last day, grace gifts are gone for good. But even now, they never provide a complete understanding of God's will. They are in this sense only partial even now. Love, on the other hand, cannot be seen as partial, for it is a revelation of the inbreaking of God's kingdom, the eternal, into the present. Love will never be gone. Rather, in eternity it will simply continue, as now, but in a world where sin which wars against love is altogether removed. So Paul has spoken of the nature of love and of its permanence. Because of this permanence and because it's not partial and because it is possessed by all Christians, it can truly function as the marker of God's people. It will not lead to pride or arrogance because that is not what love is. As we finish then, I want us just briefly to reflect theologically on how elsewhere in Scripture and in Paul's epistles, the link is shown between the work of God's Holy Spirit and love. And we need to see how important this teaching is for us. We see an indirect link between love and God's work, of course, in that amazing prophecy in Jeremiah of the New Covenant. In Jeremiah 31, verse 33, we read this, This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Both Old and New Testaments, especially in the words of Jesus, see the law as centred in loving God and neighbour. This will be established in the hearts and minds of all God's people in the New Covenant. It will mark them out in a way that it did not before the redeeming work of Christ. Then in Paul's writings, we need to remind ourselves that whereas he has called prophecy, knowledge, etc., grace gifts, he does not refer to love in this way. Rather, in Galatians 5.22, he calls love a fruit of the Spirit. In other words, it's the product of the Spirit in the Spirit-filled life. Paul's understanding of the process involved here by which all Christians possess love is most clearly expressed in Romans 5, verse 5. The love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Theologically, of course, we understand that the Spirit within us is the Spirit of Christ. As he is poured out into us, so we take on his characteristics. We become like Christ. We begin to imitate him more and more clearly as his spirit works within us and we walk the way that he has laid before us. Then, of course, the gospel of Christ crucified is the gospel of the one who showed ultimate love. And this emphasis on the cross of Christ has been clear through 1 Corinthians. But we also see this so clearly in Romans 5 verse 8 where we read, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Finally, because time precludes saying much more, listen to Ephesians 5 verse 2 where Paul writes this, Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God.
As I reflect on this in our modern church, I find it sad that often people look, just like the elitists in Corinth, to the special or prominent grace gifts for evidence of the Spirit at work among God's people. Certainly he is at work as grace gifts are given. But the staggering and wonderful, much deeper truth is what demonstrates, what identifies Christians as God's people. These people are those who are so possessed by the Spirit of Jesus that they love God and love their neighbor. Here above all is the evidence that the Spirit promised in Joel is indeed poured out on all people. All God's people will therefore show this love. And that's why in the end, as Paul concludes the epistle in 1622, he can make this staggering statement. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Come, Lord.